Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. Beautiful day out, beautiful weekend. Got to give some praise for that. Just a couple quick announcements. Um, one new one, um, the Women's Power Surge meeting, monthly meeting, is going to be um, Thursday, November 17th. Um, at 6.30 p.m. in the Hope Center. So women, um, come out. It's a good time to recharge, uh, fellowship, um, just reconnect. And um, we're doing a study on Fruits of the Spirit. Um, also, just another uh, mention for the marriage retreat at the Hyatt. Uh, it's a weekend to remember, um, sponsored by Family Life. Um, that's November 18th through 20th, so that's right in our own backyard if anyone's interested. I'm not sure if they still have um, availability, but you can go online to familylife.com. And just a friendly reminder, the um, church directory is being updated, so there's little white cards throughout the sanctuary. Um, fill those out, stick them in the basket if you can so we can update your information. And just wanted to also... Um, put back in everyone's mind the hub. Um, if you know anyone that needs prayer, encouragement, transportation, meals, any kind of need at all, um, you can call or text. Uh, the number is 443-205-2036, and that's been scrolling on the, um, the overheads as well. Okay, that's all I got for today. Morning. How's everybody doing? Doing good? Good to see you. What a beautiful day out. A beautiful week. And it's always a blessing when you don't have to have heat or air on. Of course, we've gone through both in the same day. Constantly in the day. In the day we're in there going, it's really hot, turn the air on. And my wife's going, it's freezing in here, turn the heat on. Um, but really beautiful day. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I am excited this morning. Uh, I don't know why that certain mornings I just get, get all worked up, but I'm um, super excited about today. I'll be honest, I, I, I wasn't last night. I was telling Nathan this earlier. I was kind of going over notes last night, like 1130. I was like, man, I don't even know where I'm going. Lord, I'm so confused. I don't know how to get there, even though that's not the right way to say it. I knew where I was going. I just wasn't sure how I was going to get there. And the more I read, the more I studied, the more I prepared, all that kind of stuff, the farther away from where I'm supposed to be going, I was getting. So, I don't know. So, I woke up this morning and, and felt like I had a little more clarity. Felt like the Lord was leading me to go over to, to Joe Kelly's church. And I thought, well, why are you taking me over there this morning? Maybe it's just to see everybody, whatever. But it was, it's just crazy to see how God orchestrates things. I got over there, and it was like this confirmation of, yes, you're on the right track. That's exactly what I want you to talk about. So, hopefully, that'll make a little more sense in a, in a minute. Um, I do want to thank everybody for the cards and, and gifts and all that stuff for pastor appreciation. It's embarrassing. I don't even like talking about it and everything, so I'm glad it's over. But I do feel appreciated, and thank you guys so much. Um, I, I feel appreciated all year. I really do. Um, you guys really do a great job of, of just making me feel loved. Um, so thank you. Thank you for all that. My you Thank you. So... Um, it's great to see Ken here. Ken... Out of the hospital, he's in the hospital for several weeks, he's here, uh, feeling, feeling better, still working towards getting back on his feet completely, so that's, that's awesome to see him here. Got to talk with Miss Carolyn the other day, she is in the hospital over at Easton still, right? Um, it, was, it was great to see her. Um, her reaction was priceless. Like when I got there, it was so funny because I had my hat on and I had my mask on and I, and I walked in and I was like, she's not going to know who I even am, you know? So I'm like trying to pull my mask down and so she could see and I... Still could tell that she, she really didn't know who, who I was the more that I talked. And then um, I said, well, can I pray with you? And she said, yeah, sure. And I, and I prayed, and I got done, and she looked at me, and she said, Jason! <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> so then her face got all bright, so uh, it was awesome to see her. So keep, but keep, her, in, keep her in your prayers. So um, great to talk with her. I talked with Paula, and she's hoping to be here next week. She's been dealing with pneumonia and everything, so she's hoping to be back next week. So uh, great to see Bill here this morning. So I shouldn't be calling people out because it's great to see everybody, so get myself in trouble. But um, anyway, glad you guys are here. So let's go ahead and pray, and then we will, we will jump into uh, Romans again. So let's pray. 
Uh, Father, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day, this beautiful week. We know that every single day is, is a beautiful day because it's an opportunity for us to, to praise you, to celebrate you, to impact other people. But there's something that's especially uh, invigorating when the weather is nice and the sun's shining and there's a warmth to the air. And I don't know. So, so it's, I'm just extremely thankful for the, the days you've given us this week um, and, and just the, the beauty of them. So uh, I do want to pray for this time, Lord. You, you know the wrestling I've been doing in the last couple of days on how to present exactly what I believe you've given me to present. So I just pray that you will give me clarity of thought and the ability to, to speak in a way that clearly articulates your word. I pray that you will open our, our hearts and our minds this morning to, to accept the message that you have for us because I, I do believe it's one that is extremely, extremely important, not just for us and the way that we live, but the impact that we hope to have on the people around us. So um, again, just give us clarity um, eh, with the message this morning and, and help it to go beyond that, just to go from something that's intellectual to really is something that's transformative in our lives and, and helps us to, to impact the lives of other people. So we do love you and thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be here. We definitely want to continue to lift up everyone that we've mentioned and those that we haven't. There are definitely needs everywhere that we look. And we thank you for the fact, Lord, that you are in control of every situation, that there isn't anything that's escaping your attention and your notice. But um, if it's happening, it's for a reason and you have a plan in it. So help us to seek that plan um, and to see what part you have us to play in it. So we do, again, just love you and thank you for this opportunity this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So. Uh, oh, uh, I was asked to make an announcement, too. There is no youth ministry next door, so if your child is not in here with you, you may want to go look for them. Um, <laughs> so that's something we're still working through, youth ministry and all that kind of stuff. So be praying for that. Be praying for our church. We will, we're still continuing in the conversations of where God is leading us as a ministry and what he would have us to do to be more effective in growing as a, as a body and also impacting other people. Um, I... I, I I don't want a response in this, but this is the reality of it. Be praying for me. Um, I struggle with, with, my, with my leadership. There's so many deficiencies that I have, and I'm thankful for the people that God is bringing into this ministry that sort of round out and fill in the gaps because everybody has deficiencies, right? We all, we all have things that we, we're not gifted at, that we struggle with, and we need other people that are gifted in those areas to step up and fill those voids. So this is going to be something that if we're going to have the impact that that we're called to have, it's going to happen through a body ministry, right? It's not going to be any one person or a couple of people. It's going to be through the body. So be praying that God would just lead us and where, where he wants us to go and how he wants us to move and how we're supposed to, to be a light in this community because it desperately needs it, right? So um, just be praying about all that stuff. But anyway, let's, let's jump into, into Romans chapter 11. And we've been looking at, at verses 11 through 12, and we've been here the last couple of weeks, and this is sort of be the last week, and, and we're going to jump into Romans chapter 12 next week, which I am super excited to do, because uh, the page is kind of going to turn into Romans chapter 12, where now Paul is going to go from 11 chapters of sort of this, this deep theology, this doctrine, sort of laying the foundation of the Christian faith and the gospel and all that kind of stuff, and in chapter 12, he's going to be to talk about what's that look like for us, practically speaking. Because okay, it's one thing to have the information up here, to know it, to learn it. It's something else to live it out, right? And we're going to talk about that heavily today because I think today's going to be a great transition from, from chapter 11 to chapter 12. Okay, sort of this theoretical to the practical, the theological to the practical, okay? Um, we started this two weeks ago, I guess three weeks ago, whenever it was, talking about sin, you know, and talking about what do we take away from Romans 11, 11, and 12 for us? Because as, as I've said several times now, uh, chapters 9 through 11, Paul is really pointing something at the Jews. He's answering specific questions of the Jews, and he's saying, hey, listen, God's not done with you. I know, by and large, most of you have rejected Jesus as Lord and Savior, rejected him as the Messiah, but God's not done. He, he's got a plan for you. He's going to bring you back into the kingdom, right? So that's what 9, 10, and 11 have been primarily about. So what we've been trying to do is try to kind of take away Okay, what's that mean for us? Right, and I've said that we're kind of pulling this out of context a little bit, which is usually not a very smart thing to do, but I think what we've been talking about is still biblical. It's not just exactly what Paul is talking about here. Again, because when we read the scriptures, it's important for us to realize that the writer is writing to somebody, right? And it may not be directly to us. So Romans is not written directly to us. It's to a certain group of people, a certain group of time, all of that, but we're supposed to take things away from it. Does that make sense? So Romans 9, 10, and 11, we've been, we've been sort of extrapolating some things and applying it to our lives that isn't necessarily the direct point of Paul. 
If you're going, why are you saying that? Because I want to be true to the scriptures, right? We want, we want to know what the scriptures say. We want to know the intent of it. And that's Paul's intent, to, to speak something directly to the Jews in chapters 9 through 11. But we're taking some things away from us, for us to learn, okay? So where we started was um, two or three weeks ago. We, we read it, and let's read it again, and we'll kind of recap the last couple of weeks. So chapter, chapter 11, verse 11. It says, again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Okay, and he's talking about the Jews. Have they fallen too far? Have they done too much? And we stopped there a couple of weeks ago and talked about that because that's, that's a question for all of us, right? We all stumble. We all fall. And, and the enemy would love for us to believe that we've done too much. You've gone too far. You're beyond hope. You're beyond recovery, right? And it's funny because I, I just I talked to somebody again last week who said the same thing. He said, man, I kind of fell away from the church and I, was, I didn't want to come back because I felt like people would be judging me and thinking, gosh, who's it? why are they back and where have they been and what have they been doing? So they stayed away. And I think that is a temptation that the enemy wants to put before all of us, right? That when we stumble, when we fall, he's going to say, man, you need, you need to run. You need to hide from God. You need to hide from the church. You need to hide from Christians. You've done so much now. How can you show your face there? Right? And the enemy would love for us to believe that. Okay? And Paul is asking that same question. Man, have the Jews gone too far? Have they done too much? Has God wiped their hands from them? And the answer he gives is no, not at all. Not even close. Okay? And the same answer is true for us today. I don't care what you've done in your past that the enemy keeps haunting you with, that keeps bringing you back up, saying, keeps reminding you of that. I want you to know that God is not done with you. Right? You did not go too far. That, that sin, that transgression, that falling away did not render you useless. Okay, and that's what the enemy would love for you to believe, is that, man, God can never use you again. After what you've done, how could he possibly use you? Right? And that is the farthest thing from the truth. And we found out as we kept on reading. All right? So he answers the question, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? All right, so what, was, what is Paul saying there? No, no, no. They're falling away even as part of God's plan, right? This isn't something that God went, oh, gosh, what am I going to do now? You people have fallen away. You've rejected me. What am I going to they're, do? They're, they're falling away as even part of God's plan. He knew that that was going to happen, and he wants to use it, right? He has used it. He said because of their rejection, he took the message to the Gentiles, all right? And what I wanted us to take away from that is, listen, God even wants to use our sin, and we talked about this last week. Right? God wants to use our sin, he wants to redeem that sin to impact not just you and grow you in your faith, but also impact other people, right? So we have every reason not to, not to run from God, but rather to run to God, because he says, come to me, right? Not just with your perfection, not just with your gifts, not just with the good things in your life, but I want you to come to me with all of your junk, all of your crap. Why? Because I'm going to use it, right? I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to use it for good. So when we're willing to open up and be honest about our struggles, right, that impacts people. How many people know that to be true, right? That it, God, has, he wants to use your hurts, your pains, your hang-ups to impact other people. We are comforted, why? So we can be comforters, right? So that we can go to other people and say, man, I've struggled with the same thing. Okay, so that's sort of what we talked about last week. We have every incentive to run to God, not to run away from God with our sin. Right? We made a point last week, it doesn't make sense to run from him because he knows anyway. Where would we run? Right? Do we think that just because we run from the church that God doesn't know? Do we even think that God wasn't aware that we were going to do it ahead of time? Right? We talked about that last week. Example after example after example in the scriptures, God has chosen people and said, hey, I chose you from birth. Well, hold on, God, you chose them from birth. No one ever going to stumble and fall. No one ever going to mess things up. Yep, part of the plan. I'm going to use even that. Right? So that's what we talked about last week. We haven't gone too far. We need to be willing to talk about our sin. Now, do we celebrate it? Do we, is, it a, is it a good thing? No, it's a bad thing that God will use for good. That make sense? And that's a big deal for us to understand. Because when we look at a passage like Romans chapter 8 that says, hey, God is working everything for our good, that doesn't mean everything is good. When horrible things happen in your life, guess what? They're horrible. God's just going to redeem them and use, some, use it for something good. That makes sense? All right, so last week, the thing that I, that I kind of stressed was last week was kind of a two-part, within a three-part, within a 51-part, um, because last week goes hand-in-hand hand with this week, okay? We have to be willing to, to be honest with our sin, right? The Bible tells us to confess our sins one to another. We need to be willing to come into agreement with God that, hold on, this is wrong, and guess what? I want to openly declare that. I want to publicly declare that. Does that mean in every environment we need to be just spitting out our sin? No, there's a safe environment, 
which this, is, this should be, our gathering should be a safe place where we can come in and say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm struggling, right? Even, even as a pastor, I should be able to stand up here and go, you know what, I struggled this week. I fell down this week. I really, and man, I did. My wife and I got in an argument this week because I was impatient and I was selfish and I was looking at things from my perspective and I took offense to things that I shouldn't have take, took offense to, right? Pray for me. I need help in those areas. I should be able to stand up here and share that with you, right? And hopefully that inspires other people to go, you know what? I struggle with that too. I'm not alone in that. Man, I thought I was because that's another thing the enemy wants to do, separate us, right? Get us by ourselves and have us believe the lie that you're the only one. You're the only one in here that's struggling with whatever you're struggling with. You're the only one in here that's afraid of whatever you're afraid of, right? You're the only one. So we need to be able to be honest so that other people go, oh, wait, I'm not the only one, okay? And I think that helps to bring camaraderie. It helps to bring unity in that. Okay, so we need to be willing to bring that. But if that's the only, the only thing that we do, um, what we're doing is we're, we may be bringing comfort, but we're not bringing hope. We're not necessarily bringing help. And that's what I want to talk about today. That's the other side of the coin. When we begin to, to share with other people, when we say, man, I have struggled with that too, there needs to be victory in that. Okay, does that make sense? This is the big verse we looked at last week. We're going to use this again sort of as our, as our anchor verse, our foundation this morning. Revelation 12, 11. It says, they triumphed over him. And, and just stop right there. Who's they? In this passage, who's they? Who is it that triumphed? Us, Christians. Right? This is in the book of Revelation. This is looking into the future. This is saying this is what's eventually going to happen when he's unfolding the last times, the end days, right? When, when Jesus comes back and all that kind of stuff. And he's saying they, the saints, Christians, were the overcomers. It says, they triumphed. They overcame. Right? They conquered over him. Who's him? The enemy right? Over the enemy. We talked about what's the word devil mean in the original language, in the Greek. It means the accuser, the one that would come to us and say, you've gone too far. You've done too much. You're not going to be loved. You're not going to be extended grace. You're not going to be extended mercy. Are you kidding me? Who do you think you are, right? You're, you've done too much. How do we overcome those accusations? How do we come to overcome the accuser? He's going to tell us. It says, they triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. All right, so we said there was kind of two parts of that. They triumphed over him in two different ways. One, the blood of the lamb. And we're going to talk about that today. The power of the blood of the lamb. If we are not depending on that, trusting in that, we are not going to experience victory. Okay? So that's one. We'll talk about that today. And we kind of unpacked half of this part last week. And by the word of their testimony. We talked about the power of our testimony. We need to be willing to share. And part of that testimony is saying, guess what? I messed up. I'm broken. That's part of our testimony. we got to be willing to share that part, right? But then there's another part that comes along with it that we're going to really unpack today, and that is the victorious part, the overcoming part, okay? And I think that is greatly lacking in the church. I think when we look and we say, why aren't we experiencing um, the impact that we should be having in our community, right? I think it's because our testimony doesn't carry the power that it should because I think it's incomplete. Right? I think it's incomplete. I think it's wonderful for us. And how many people have ever had this conversation where you're talking with someone and they're sharing their sin, they're sharing their struggle, and you go, man, I struggle the same way. I'm a sinner too. Anybody ever said that? I'm a sinner too. Okay? Now, is that true? Yes and no. Okay? Yes and no. Now, I want to be very careful in this because I don't want to be a hypocrite. It drives me nuts when people are not willing to, on the front end, uh, identify with their sin, right? And, and hopefully this will make more sense in a minute when we get into some scripture, right? When I hear people go, you know, I'm, I'm not a liar, I just lie. I'm not a thief, I just steal stuff, right? I'm not an angry person, I just get angry, okay? That's crazy talk, right? But I want to be careful in how I say that because we're going to talk about in a minute how we are transformed through Christ to the point that we are not our sin, right? We're given a new name, and we'll talk about that in a second, okay? But we have to, we have to get that when we're having this conversation with people. Like, how many people have ever heard people, somebody say, sin is sin? Is sin, sin? Hmm, depends. Depends. We'll talk about that too. All right, so let's look at this first. Overcomer, what's the definition of an overcomer? We are called to be overcomers. That's what it says. The saints are overcomers. By definition, we are overcomers. We'll see that in the scriptures here in a second. All right, but here's the definition of it in the, in the dictionary. 
A person who overcomes something. Now, usually I hate when you get a definition that has the word of the word you're trying to define. Does that make sense? What is an overcomer? Someone who overcomes. Well, that's not helpful. <laughs> right? That's, that's stupid. But in this case, I actually kind of like it because it's one of these smack in the face kind of moments. All right, how many overcomers do we have in here? All right, if you're a Christian, we just said all the saints are overcomers. We should be raising our hands. But it beg- we're all tentative. Now we're like, hold on, I don't want to raise my hand. Why? Because it begs the question, what is an overcomer? A person who overcomes something. So it begs the question, if you were an overcomer, what have you overcame? And I think this is the feeling that we have, and I think this is what weakens our testimony because we're not sure what we're overcoming. What exactly have we overcame? Like, my hope is that by the end of this, you stop and you examine your life and you say, you answer that question, what have I overcame? What am I in the process of overcoming? Because that's supposed to be part of our testimony. Okay? All right, so let's let's dive into this a little bit. Let's keep on reading. A person who overcomes something, one who succeeds in dealing with or gaining control over some problem or difficulty. This should cause us to, again, say, okay, man, what, what have I gained control over? What is the problem or difficulty in my life that I have overcame? If I have, haven't got any, then maybe I'm not an overcomer. Okay? To defeat an opponent or to prevail. Right? I think this is such a thing that is lacking in the church. How many of us walk with a feeling of victory? I'm, I'm victorious. I'm an overcomer. There should be something in the way that I walk that should be different from the people that are being defeated. Does that make sense? But I believe we're lacking that power in our testimony because we identify with the people that are struggling too. Okay, and we'll see why that's a good thing, but then we have to elevate and go beyond that. All right, so let's, let's dive in. 1 John 2, 12 through 14. Let's talk about this. Why are we overcomers if we're a Christian? Why are we automatically, by definition, overcomers? 1 John 2, 12 through 14. It says, I am writing to you. This is John writing to Christians. He's going to tell us that, who he's writing to. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Okay, he's going to set the basis there. So what is it that, that he's talking about? Your sins have been forgiven. All right, it says verse 13. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him. And who's he talking about? Christ, right? Know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Okay, he says you have. Notice what tense is that? Past tense. This is something that has decisively happened. You have overcome the evil one, the accuser, but the one that's looking to destroy your life. You have already got victory. All right? Verse 14. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong. What's the tense in that one? Present tense. You are strong strong. All right, and I want us to understand that because we'll see that show up here in a minute because there should be a connection between these two things. Our past victory, the victory we received when we put our faith in Jesus should have ongoing ramifications, right? We should receive strength and power because of that victory, okay? But strength and power for what? Talk about that. And the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. How many times was that word overcome in that one passage? Like three or four times we hear that. We have overcome. We have overcome. We have overcome. Why does John keep saying that in that little time, short time? I think it's because we have to be convinced of that. We got to know that. You are an overcomer. Right? We need to hear that. We need to be able to say that in, to ourselves. I am an overcomer. All right? 1 John 4, 4. It says, you, dear children, are from God. Now, we're going to start to unpack as to why are we overcomers? How are we overcomers? Right? Here's the first clue we get. You, dear children, are from God. So those that are from God are overcomers. You have already overcome, okay, and have overcome them because the one who is in you, there's another clue, who are those that overcome? The people who have Christ in them because he who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So where does our victory come from? Christ, right? Jesus is the one who gives us our victory. 1 John 5, 3 through 5. He says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God, here we go again, born of God, so if you're born again, if you're a Christian, you put your faith in Jesus Christ as as Lord and Savior, and you have been born again, in that being born again, you receive victory. You have overcome, right? For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith, all right? So how do we we 
access this victory through faith in Christ and what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, this is the blood of the lamb. This is why the blood of the lamb becomes so important. It's not just a saying, it's not just a cliche. There is power in the blood of the lamb, right? What he did on the cross, his victory on the cross is our victory. And we access that through faith, through believing that he did that for me, believing that he died for me, that he paid for my sins on the cross. My sins are forgiven, right? The accuser has no grounds to come to me now and call me a sinner. Jesus has paid for him. Verse 5, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, so where do we receive our victory? It's not because I'm awesome. It's not because I have such stick to It's not because I have such perseverance. It's not because I'm so skilled, so talented, any of that. My victory has nothing to do with me. It has to do with Jesus. He is the foundation of my victory. Does that make sense? I mean, it's going to be important in a second that we understand this, and this isn't just something that we intellectually assent to. We can't just agree and go, yeah, I believe that's true. No, 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 it has got to be a foundational part of who we are, right? That we understand that our victory is found in him, and it has already been won, okay? Right, let's keep reading. John 16, 32 to 33. This is Jesus speaking. He says, a time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be, you will be scattered, each to your own home. Okay, I love this, because what's he saying? You're going to stumble, you're going to fall, and we'll talk about that in a second. He says, but I want you to understand something. He says, you will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Okay, we should have a peace, a, a resolve in coming to the knowledge that I am an overcomer. My victory is won. That should bring this peace to us in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of my stumbles and falling. Okay, it says, in this world you will have trouble. Anybody know that to be true? Yes, you're going to have trouble. Yes, you're going to stumble and fall. Yes, you're going to struggle. Yes, you're going to come up short. You're going to experience all of these things. He says, but take heart. Why? Because I have overcome the world. So where do we find comfort and peace in the midst of our struggle, in the midst of our stumbling, even in the midst of our falling? Where do we go back to? Jesus' victory. Because he has won, I have won. All right? John 8, 34 through 36. So Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now this is going to become so important in what we're going to talk about today. So everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Anybody here a sinner? Anybody still sin? So the question becomes, are you a slave to sin? Is that who you are? Jesus is going to say no. John is going to say no. All right, verse 35, he says, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. All right, so understand, there's two different choices, two different groups of people in this passage. There are slaves and there are sons. Which one are you? And the question is why? Are you a son or a daughter because you are following the rules? because you're doing everything that you're supposed to do, because you are you're not stumbling and falling, because you're living your life perfect. Is that why you're a son or a daughter? No, you're a son or a daughter because you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's why. And at that moment, you're a son. You're a daughter. That is your new identity. You are no longer a slave. Got it? So who are we? Sons, daughters, not slaves, not sinners. Right? That is not our identity anymore. So we have to be careful when we start saying, I'm a sinner too. We've got to be careful in that. Okay? Do we commit sins? Yes, but they no longer define us. They've been paid for. Okay? And I was trying to think of a great like, illustration to, kind of, to bring this to light, and I, and I struggled and really couldn't come up with anything good. Um, but this is about as close as I could come. Is there a different between, difference between someone who goes into debt, right? They, they handle their money poorly, um, who has no money, and someone else who has a rich dad. Is there a difference? Yes. Why? Because dad can bail you out. And I know this is like, that's a terrible analogy. Understand this. Should we be wasting our money? Should we be making poor choices with our money? Absolutely not. But listen, I got a rich daddy who pays for it. Now, if that causes, and we're going to read this passage of scripture in a minute, that makes this illustration kind of work, I think. Um, if I do that and know that I've got a rich dad who will cover up my mistakes and it leads me to say, so therefore I'll do whatever I want to do, you're not a son. You don't understand what it means to have a rich dad, right? My rich dad should cause me to go, gosh, my, my father loves me so much and everything that he has, man, he is willing to give to me. Why would I abuse that, right? 
This is the way that it is when it comes to our sin. Do we commit sin? Yes, but Jesus pays for that. He's covered that. And if that calls you to go, okay, well, then I can do whatever I want to do. It's probably not for you. You're probably still a slave. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, so let's keep on reading. Hopefully it doesn't come in the, in the more focus. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And I love the fact that it says indeed, for sure. We are sons. We need to guarantee ourselves that. We need to reiterate that in our mind. We need to be assured of that. I am a son. I am a son. I am a son. The devil will want to come to you and go, no, you're not. Are you kidding? The way you're messing up, you can't possibly, he doesn't love you anymore. You can't possibly be a son. But my sonship isn't based on how good I am. It's not based on my merit. It's based on who my father is and that he loves me and adopts me. And that what Ephesians 1 says, we read that last week, that we have been adopted by God. Why? Because we were great and he wanted to adopt us because he needed us? No. I got this quote written on my desk that says, God didn't adopt us because he needed sons. He adopted us because we needed father. Right? We got to understand that. God didn't look at us and go, man, you're the pick of the litter. I'm going to take you. No, no, no. He looked and said, no, you need me. And he steps into our lives. Right? So we have to understand that there's a difference between slaves and sons. And we've got to stop identifying with being a slave to sin. When we do that, we are, we are just negating what God has done for us, what Christ did on the cross, okay? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 puts it in these no uncertain terms. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here, okay? When you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, right, we become new. We are not who we used to be. Does that make sense? So we have to be, be careful identifying with who we used to be, okay? Does that make sense? So when we have these conversations with people and we start to talk about, yes, I understand what it means to be a sinner. We have to understand that there should be something that comes after that because it's not who we are anymore. Okay? But I think the problem is so few of us have experienced true victory in our lives that we don't know what it means to be an overcomer, so we don't walk in being an overcomer. We still walk in sin. We still walk according to that old identity. Right? All right, so let's, let's unpack that a little bit more. Romans 6. So let's talk about this, how we've got to make this transition. If you are a Christian, you are a new creation. That is a, that is a positional salvation that has already happened. You've been given um, a new name. You are a new person that has already happened. And we talked about this months and months and months ago in the book of Romans, right? But here's the thing. We're still living in this pla- on this planet. We're still living in these sinful bodies. We're still impacted by sin. We're still impacted about that. So we've been freed from the penalty of sin, but we still are struggling with how do, we, how do we walk in freedom from the power of sin in our lives? And listen, we are called to do that. We are called to walk in freedom from the power of sin in our lives. All right, I think far too often we, we relinquish that and we, and we relegate ourselves to still living in sin. Does that make sense? You with me on that? I think, I think we have got to understand that we are not called to live sinful lives. Is it inevitable that we're all going to sin? Yes, but do we resign ourselves to that fact? Like, do we wake up in the morning and go, well, I'm going to sin today anyway, so this is okay? Is that what we do? No. We strive for perfection each and every day, right? We strive to walk in holiness each and every day. I think the problem is as Christians, we don't. I think we feel like we're going to sin, we're, we're just like everybody else, and listen, the fact of the matter is, we're not. I know that's, that's not popular in today's world because we're not supposed to create groups, Right? As Christians, we have access to something that other people don't. The kingdom of heaven, right? The power of God, the very spirit of God, the Holy Spirit lives in us. For what? So what, we walk the same way everybody else walks? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Is the Holy Spirit just a tag along? Is he just, or what? Or is he supposed to be influential in our lives? Changing the way that we live our lives, empowering us to live this life that's holy and pleasing to the Lord. Right? That's what we're called to. But are we walking in that? If we're not, then we will walk just like everybody else walks and have the same story that everybody else has. Right? We'll walk in defeat like everybody else. We'll walk in stress and anxiety like everybody else. We won't walk in victory. Right? And that's what we're called to. If we're really going to impact other people, we have to walk in that. Okay? So this is Romans 6, 1 through 7. We looked at this a couple months ago. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? If, if our attitude is, man, my sins are forgiven, my sins are forgiven, so therefore I can walk and do whatever I want to do, we don't understand grace, right? We don't get it, and our salvation we probably ought to question, okay? So we, Paul's saying, no, this isn't the attitude that we should have. The fact that our sins are forgiven and my sin is not the same as somebody whose sins aren't forgiven um, should be something that melts my heart. 
It should be something that causes me to overflow with gratitude to God, right? That my sin is not looked at the same way that other sin is looked at, unforgiven sin. Okay, so when people say, well, sin is sin, <sighs> yes and no. Are all sins serious to God? Yes. But there is a world of difference between forgiven sin and unforgiven sin, right? My forgiven sin is going to lead me to heaven, not hell. Unforgiven sin is going to lead me to hell. That makes sense? So there's a world of difference. Have your sins been forgiven? If you're a Christian, what's the answer? Yes. So your sin is not the same as somebody who has not asked for forgiveness, who doesn't have Jesus in their life. Those sins are not the same. Your sins have condemned you, and you're on your way to hell. My sins have been forgiven, and I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. All right? Now, we should walk differently then. Do we walk in an arrogance? No, but we should walk in this assurance of who we are, right? And in walking in this, we walk in this hope that should be contagious to other people who say, I want that. I want that hope. I want that assurance. I don't want to feel this condemnation. I don't want to feel separated from God. I don't want to feel like, like I've done too much. I don't want to feel that way, all right? But if we're not walking in it, where will they turn, okay? It's not enough just to identify with people in their sin. Like, that's... It's not going to be helpful. I was going to talk about this later on, but I'm sort of already in it now. Let's go ahead and talk about it now. Um, I was having a conversation with Rachel Trafford at the, at the last football game, and she's having a procedure done. Uh, when, she hasn't had it done yet, has she? Tuesday. Having her gallbladder taken out. And she says she's never been uh, under anesthesia before. So she was a little anxious about it, a little nervous about it, right? So I'm talking to her, and I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I've been put under several times, lots of times, Right? Now, if in sharing that story, that's where I ended, right? So she's really anxious about this. She's kind of nervous about it, doesn't know what to expect, all that. And I go, oh, yeah, I've been under anesthesia a lot. Is that helpful? Yeah. Right? Whatever a little bit of hope kind of rose up in her when she went, oh, you've been through it too? I did nothing with it, right? To say, yeah, I've been through that too, doesn't do anything to help her, Right? may make her feel more comfortable if somebody else has gone through it, but it doesn't give her any hope. It doesn't help her with her anxiety, right? Because what happens if it was a terrible experience, right? But when I followed it up and went, oh, man, I've done that. I've been under a lot. And she went, oh, have you? And I was like, yeah, yeah, it made out fine. It made out great. Now all of a sudden there's hope that comes along with that, right? For us to have a conversation with somebody who goes, man, I'm really struggling with this sin. And I go, yeah, I struggle with that too. Okay. So what, what help was that, right? I know misery loves company, so maybe you feel like you're in it by yourself. But listen, nobody on the Titanic cared that somebody else was going down with them, right? It may bring them some momentary comfort, but at the end of the day, show me where the lifeboat is, right? For me to walk over and go, hey, we're both sinking. You go, well, thank God. I'm glad somebody else is going down with me. No, no, no. You want somebody to come over and go, hey, we're sinking. We're both sinking. This is, this is a bad situation but there's lifeboats over there. I've been in them. I know where they're at. Follow me. That's what we're called to as Christians, right? So just to go, yeah, I'm a sinner too. Okay, great. We're both going to hell, I guess. How is that helpful? We need to be able to go, hey, man, listen, I struggle with the same thing, but guess what? God delivered me. I think the problem is, is not enough of us are walking in deliverance. Not enough of us are walking in, as, as an overcomer, walking in victory. Why? Because I don't think we've overcome many things in our lives. Like, can we be honest? How many people are still struggling with something you struggled with your whole life? I got my hand up, man. There's things that I still struggle with, right? That by now I should have experienced some victory. Right? But the problem is, again, people are looking around at Christians and they're going, yeah, they're in the same boat as me. We're not supposed to be in the same boat with them. We're supposed to be in a different boat going, come get in my boat. Right? All right, so this, maybe I've made all this moot. Let's go back and read it anyway. All right. So shall we go on sinning so the grace may increase? By no means. We are those, we are those who have died to sin. No, I love that. We have died to sin. We are dead to sin. We're not people who entertain sin and mess around with sin and feel like sin's okay, right? We're dead to sin. It says, how can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ has, was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And I read that too fast because that is an important verse right there. Maybe I can read that again. 
we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, okay, so in order that there's a reason why we identify with Christ in, in his death, right? There's, we don't just identify with him in his death and that's the end of the story. Like, that'd be a horrible story, isn't it? Hey, Jesus got crucified. You should be crucified too. That's a terrible story. But thank God, that's not the whole story. Right? Even though that is the story we give so many people, we yeah, am a sinner too. Okay? So in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a, what? New life. We're not raised from the dead to lead the same life. There should be a difference in our lives, right? A practical difference, not just a theoretical difference, not just that, well, I know I'm in heaven one day. I'm going to be in heaven someday. I've got that kind of in my back pocket. It should fundamentally change the way that we live our lives, all right? We're to live a new life. It should look different, right? There should be something that people come in and go, hold on, wait, you seem different than you used to be. Like, wouldn't that be a wonderful way to open a conversation? Wow, you seem so different. I think that's the way we're supposed to live. I think there should be a noticeable difference in us where people walk up to us and go, hold on, you're not the same person. You used to whatever, and now you don't, right? For if we have been united with him in the death like this, like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that the old self was crucified. And I love the language of this. It was crucified. That's not who you are anymore. With him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. We should not be walking as slaves to sin. So whatever it is that you're still struggling with, the intention is not for you to continue to struggle with it. That's not why Jesus went to the cross. He didn't go to the cross that my life would look exactly the same, that I would struggle with the same things that I struggled with before, right? He died on the cross that we would have victory in what areas of our lives? All of them, man. I don't think there's any of them that we go, well, Jesus didn't die for this. He didn't die for my, my impatience. He didn't die for my anger. He didn't die for my unforgiveness of other people. He didn't die for that stuff. He just died that my sins would be, be, uh, be forgiven and I'd make it to heaven. Nah, that's not the only reason why he died, right? He died that we would live a new life, that our lives would be noticeably different, that we would be a light to other people, okay? Colossians 3. 1 through 10, and, and I think this is where we make the mistake. I think we don't make the transition from the things that happen spiritually in our lives. They don't manifest themselves into the physical realm, right? Now where it's a noticeable difference, right? This, I think we've done a disservice when we go, well, I got Jesus in my heart. Well, that's great. Have Jesus in your heart. Have him in your mind. But guess what? Have him in your hands. Have him in your mouth, right? These things should change the way that we live too, not just a, a well, I, Jesus changed my heart. Did he really? Because if you change your heart, it should be changing what's coming out of your mouth, right? But somehow we disconnect those two things. I'm on my way to heaven. Uh, he's, he's forgiven me of my sins, right? He overcame my sin. Okay, but is he overcoming your anger problem? Is he overcoming your unforgiveness? Is he overcoming your addiction? Is he overcoming your physical I issue? Is he overcoming any these things as well? Because we need to be looking to be overcomers in every area of our lives. There isn't any area where we, where we accept defeat. Right, like to get back to what I was talking about earlier, and I've probably shared this before with my kids, like coaching basketball. I'll ask, them, are they gonna, are you gonna make every shot? No. So are you gonna be perfect? No. So which shots are okay to miss? See, the problem is when you go into it thinking it's okay to miss shots. Well, okay, that one was okay to miss, and this one's okay to miss. Right? It's a horrible mentality. We should be going into it not to miss. We should be living our lives not to sin. Not saying, well, some sin is okay because I'm never going to be perfect. I'm a sinner too. No, <laughs> that's not what we've been called to. We've been called to walk in sinlessness. Is that the goal? All right? Here we go. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. It says, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ, with Christ in God. Now, I love this because we're going to get this picture of past tense and future tense, right? But it's the present that I think we struggle with. We start talking about past tense, have we been saved, right? The Bible talks about it in three different ways. We've been saved, we're being saved, we will be saved. All right, so this is the part, it's past tense. Our life has been hidden in Christ, right? We have been saved. Positionally, we have been saved, right? We are a new creature. It's who we are. Now, what, how do we walk it out? says Christ, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Okay, what tense is that? When he, when he appears, future tense. So the past tense is the guaranteed, 
Future tense is guaranteed, but what about this middle section? Are we just writing that off? Are we people who are taking what happened in the past and just looking forward to the future? What about now? What about the present? Right? Do those two things impact the way that we live now? They should, because this is what he's going to say. Put to death. Who put the, who, who's putting it to death? You put it to death. We got some participation in this. We should be striving for this. We should be trying to do this. You put to death. Now, we're going to talk about how we put it to death, because we don't do it by our own effort. We don't do it by our own might. We don't do it by our own intellect. We don't do it by our own logic. We don't do it that way. We're going to see why it is so important that we go back to the blood of Jesus, because that serves as the foundation and the tool that we use to put these things to death. That makes sense? So put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Are you putting these things to death, or are you comfortable with it? Have you resigned yourself to the fact that this is just who I am? That's just how I react. I, I, just, I just speak my mind, just who I am. Really? Are you supposed to be that way? Are we supposed to be impatient? Are we supposed to be harsh? Are we supposed to be critical? Are we supposed to be all that stuff? No, so if we're not supposed to be, we should be putting it to death. But unfortunately, far too Christians, too many Christians are comfortable with our sin. We're okay with it. It's not that big of a deal, right? It's something we're just struggling with like everybody else. We're just struggling like everybody else. We're not called to struggle like everybody else. Why? Because Jesus died for us. Right? He's paid for us. He's empowered us. He's given the Holy Spirit to overcome these things, not to be resigned to them. All right? Verse 6, because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways. And I like that. You used to walk in these things. We're not supposed to keep walking in them. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But you, but now, and I love that, but now. We did a whole sermon on that year, uh, months ago. felt like years ago. But now. We should have a but now story. How many people know that's true? Okay, if you're a Christian, you already have one. But here's the thing. We should be building on that. We should be having ongoing additions to that more and more but now stories, right? But now you must rid, must rid, also rid yourselves of all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Anybody struggle with any of that stuff? I do. I struggle with it all the time. Show of hands, anybody else struggle with any of this stuff? All right, we're good. We're good then. We're all struggling with it. We're all in the same boat, so we're good. No! We need to overcome and you should be an inspiration to me. I should be an inspiration to you. I shared this last week. I love when people come up and go, man, you're just so identifiable. I can identify with you. Man, you share your struggles. You're transparent. You're open. You're honest about these things. And I just really connect with you, identify with you. Great. That needs to happen, right? Because I need you to see that I'm not special somehow. I'm not somebody that's exempt from these things. I still struggle with things. I still fall down. I still stumble. I need you to see me that way. But at the same time, if you never see victory in me, I'm doing a disservice to you. All I'm doing is making you feel comfortable by having company, right? And that really started to bother me after a while when people come up and go, man, you're so relatable because I know you see you're a sinner too. Crap. I'm like, yes, I struggle with sin, but I'm not a sinner. I'm supposed to be an overcomer. That's what I want you to see in me, yeah. right? I want you to look at me and go, man, you're an overcomer and I want to overcome too. That's what we want people to see in our lives. Not just that, man, okay, you're just like me. No, I'm not. I'm supposed to be different. I've been called to be different. You've been called to be different, not the same. All right? You used to walk in these ways in your life that you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed. And I like this being renewed. It's a work in progress. We're a work in progress. We're learning to, that, that we're free. And I've shared this before. I remember back in psychology class, I don't remember a whole lot from that time, but one of the things I do remember, there was a study that was done where they put a fence up around kids, right, that said you can't go any farther past this fence. And what they found out is that when they take the fence down, the kids still stayed in that same area. They had been conditioned to walk in that same area. And I think the problem is we're, we've been the same way our whole lives. We've walked in sin. We've said, man, this, this is who we are. This is how we define ourselves. And then Jesus comes along and takes those fences down. and goes, no, you're free. And we're still in the same spot. Right? We're still sitting in the, in the cell, even though the door's been opened. The chains have been knocked off. We've got to learn to walk in freedom. Okay? So it is a process. So I don't want us to think, oh, gosh, well, I should be perfect at this. No, it's a process, but we should be growing in that process. Again, our stories of but now should be growing. It's something we should experience more and more. I right? love this Charles Spurgeon quote. It says, these saints use the doctrine of atonement, not as a pillow to rest their weariness, but as a weapon to subdue their sin. I love that. 
what Jesus did on the cross, the blood that was shed for us, is not something that makes us just be able to rest easier at night waiting for heaven. Is that one of the benefits? Yes, absolutely. But it also should be a weapon that we are using saying, I'm going to defeat the enemy in my life. I'm not going to walk the way that I used to walk. I'm not going to do the things that I used to do. Why? Because Jesus set me free from that. Right? I love that. Are you using the blood of Jesus as a weapon to defeat sin in your life? If not, we're not using it to its maximum power. We're not using it for its, for its full intention. Hebrews 9, 14 to 15. It says, How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciousness? I love that. So he cleanses our conscience. He comes in and says, hey, you're forgiven. That's not who you are anymore. I've created you new. You're mine. You're not a sinner anymore. That is not what, how you're characterized. That is not your name. You are now a son and a daughter. Right? He comes at to cleanse our minds, to give us a peace about that. But is that all? No. To cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that so that, why in the world does he want us to be grounded in the fact that we are a new creation? I'm new. I've been set free. Why does that have to be a part of our, of our mental makeup, that we believe it in our hearts? Why? Because that's not, there's a purpose for that, so that we may serve the living God. There's a way that we should live our life that is founded and grounded in what Jesus did on the cross, right? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised, and etern promised eternal inheritance. When do we receive the promised eternal inheritance? When do we receive these graces from God? Are we waiting until we die? Is that when we receive them? Or do we start receiving them now? When we are changed, when we are set free, when we are new, we start to experience the graces of God, or at least we're supposed to. We're not just waiting for heaven to get here so we experience them. It's made available now. Is it made available in full? No, we, haven't, we don't receive our glorified bodies now, but we receive so many of these graces now that we don't take advantage of. We don't live in it. Does that make sense? All right, let's keep reading. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. We should be living a different life. Why? Because we've been changed. We're not the same. We're not who we used to be. And that should be our story. When we talk to people, we shouldn't be saying, yes, I'm in the same boat as you. I'm with you. I struggle too. I'm a sinner too. Right? That can't be all of it. We've got to have a but at the end of that. Am I struggling with sin right now? Yes, but I know Jesus has set me free and he's going to give me the power to overcome. Right? I used to struggle with that, but I don't struggle with that anymore because I've been changed. This should be our story. John 9, 25. I was blind, but now I see. Imagine if it was just, I was blind. Okay, then what? Right? It wouldn't be, very, it wouldn't be all that great if it not that impressive. That guy goes, yeah, I struggle with my eyesight too. <laughs> that wouldn't be helpful. What kind of testimony is that? But what a powerful testimony to go, no, 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 I was blind. Right? I was angry. I was resentful. I was hateful. I was malicious. I was all of this. But now... I can see. Now I'm gracious. Now I'm patient. Now I'm loving. Now I'm forgiving. Right? This is our testimony. This is the power of our testimony. And it's grounded in the blood of the Lamb, what Jesus did on the cross for us. He forgave us of our sins. He created us anew. We are not who we used to be. We need to walk in it. That's why Hebrew, I love Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. And they, we'll end with two more passages. We won't break them down. I just love the sound of them. We should read these on a regular basis to remind us who we are. Therefore, therefore, I love that, therefore. What's the therefore? Therefore, because we've been set free. Right? All of Hebrews is talking about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. Given all of that, so since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders. I love that. Let us throw it off. Are you throwing off everything that hinders you? Or are you comfortable with it? I think we're far too often comfortable with our, with our struggle and with our sin. We, we, we hold on to it rather than saying, no, 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 I can lay it down. Why? Because it's not connected to me anymore. Those chains have been broken. I don't have to hold them. Right? We should be casting them off. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. I love that. Have you ever seen a, a people, one person start running and somebody else starts running? Like This is what I can guarantee right now. If somebody in here started to get up and started to run, I guarantee everybody else would be going, oh, what's happening? What's going, where are they going? Right? If I'm sitting here struggling, limping along, can't hardly move, and you're sitting there struggling, limping along too, why, we're not either one going anywhere. 
That's not inspirational. But if I say, you get up and you start going, I'm going to go, can I get up too? Hold on. I want to go. I want to be a part of that. We're meant to be running so that other people go, I want to run. I'm going with you. Let's go. But instead they're going, no, you're limping along right with me. We're both going to stand around and do nothing. Right? We should be running, sprinting this race, running with this perseverance. So let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Okay? He's the foundation. He's the basis for our running. Right? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are you running? Are you content with walking around with people that can't run? John Piper said, the only sin you can defeat is a forgiven sin. We've got to understand that our sin is forgiven. And in that, we can truly have victory. All right, last one, Romans 8. We read this before. I love this. It's a great victory chapter. We should go back and read chapter 8. It tells us who we are and what we have to look forward to. It says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, he will not also... Will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than what? conquerors are you a conqueror yes. yes we should be able to say that triumphantly boldly i am a conqueror i am an overcomer okay that is who we are as christians we should be proving that each and every day in our lives by seeing the victories that jesus provides in our lives victories over addiction victory over addiction to pornography victory over uh, over whatever ailments in, in our lives we should have victory after victory after victory after victory that people look at and go that person's a victor he's, vict he's victorious He's a conqueror. Who doesn't want to be a part of the winning team? Everybody. Well, what happens if I keep identifying with the losing team? Nobody's going to want to be on that team, right? We should be victors. People should be looking at us going, I want that. All right? Uh, let's keep reading. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who, him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The enemy wants to convince us you've done too much, you've gone too far, right? You need to run from God, you need to hide from God. And what Paul's going to say, no, you don't. You need to run to God, run to him with your sin, right? We need to run to brothers and sisters in Christ with our sin, to confess them openly, to drag that crap into the light, to say, man, I'm struggling, I'm falling, I'm hurting, I'm struggling with things in life. I need you to walk with me, right? We come alongside one another. So then the person that gives the testimony should be given a testimony in that group that goes, hey, 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 I'm with you, I've struggled with that too, but guess what? I overcame through the blood of the Lamb. That's how, the, that's how this word of our testimony is supposed to bring victory to each and every one of us, but it won't if we listen to the enemy and go and run and hide with our sin. All right? Last thing. This is it, Charles Spurgeon. I'll leave you with this quote. It says, The precious blood of Jesus is not meant for us merely to admire and exhibit. I love that. Is it wonderful to, to look and say, Man, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. That's awesome. Should we be constantly doing that? Absolutely. But if that's all we do is just admire it like it's behind a glass case somewhere, it isn't supposed to be handled and used, right? Have you, have you ever been to, to a museum or something where there's something back there, you don't get to touch it? You don't get to, you don't get to handle it? You don't get to use it? Right? Imagine, I kind of feel like it's my shed, um, with all these wonderful tools in there that you don't use, right? It's great for me to open my doors and go, man, there's my circular saw, and there's my saws all, and there's my, and I don't use any of them. That is not what Jesus' death on the cross is meant to be. Where at night I go in my prayer closet and I open it up and I go, oh, look, Jesus died for me, isn't that awesome? And close it back up. That's not what it's there for. It's to use, to be power in our lives. Right? This is what Spurgeon is saying. Right? It's not meant just to merely. We, should we admire it? Absolutely. But is that it? No. He says we must not be content to talk about it and extol it. And that's something else. We can't be content to come in here on, church, on Sundays in church service and just talk about the victory that Jesus gave us on the cross. It's not enough just to talk about it. If it never impacts our lives, we never experience it. If we never walk in it, it's useless. Right? He says to talk about it and extol it and do nothing with it. But we are to use it in the great crusade against unholiness and unrighteousness 
to what is said of us. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Like People should be able to point to that and go, why do, you, why do they walk in victory? Because of what Jesus did on the cross for them. This precious blood is, is to be used for overcoming and consequently for holy warfare. We dishonor it if we do not use it to that end. This is why Jesus died on the cross. Is it to secure our, our, our eternity in heaven one day? Absolutely. But not just that. It's supposed to impact our present now. We should be, we should be understanding and, and receiving and walking in victory now. Right? Are we looking forward to that day of ultimate victory when we receive that new body and all of sin is out of here? We don't have to deal with the presence of sin anymore. We don't deal with hurt and pain and struggle and all that kind of stuff. Yes, we look forward to that day. Right? I can't wait for that day. But we get to experience part of that now. We should be experiencing victory now. And here's the sad part about it. Not only is it robbing us of the joy of walking in that victory today, but it's robbing other people because they need to see the victory. People need to see that there's hope out there. Right? They don't see hope when they see us struggling with the same thing. Just to simply go, yeah, we're on the same boat together is not enough. It doesn't bring hope. We need to say, no, 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 I used to be this, and now I'm not. I used to be a slave to sin. Now I've been set free. Are we walking in victory? Are we overcomers? If so, we need to live like it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this, for this message, and, and I, I want to repent for the fact that I don't walk in victory so often, that I can hang my head just as quick as anybody and, and feel like I'm being defeated and I'm never going to have victory and I'm never going to win. Lord, I pray that you would forgive me for the times that I have had conversations with other people where my main objective was just simply to identify with them, where I said, man, I'm a sinner too, don't worry about it, and I stopped short there. Do we want people to understand that, yes, we struggle too? Absolutely. They need to be able to see the humanity in us for sure. They need to be able to identify with that part. But, Lord, they so need to see the victory as well. So I pray that you will help me first and foremost to experience that victory. I pray that, that you, will, you will help me to experience it in, in the areas where maybe I've resigned to the fact that I'm never going to experience, where I thought, well, that's just how I am. I'm never going to change. Uh, I pray that I would experience it in those areas that I've become too comfortable with, where it's become sort of part of my identity to, to complain and go on rants and be a little impatient and all that stuff. I pray that you will forgive me for that, that you will help me to walk in victory, that you will give me victory over that. Um, because people need to see that. Lord, I want that to be my testimony. I want my testimony to be, man, I know what it's like to be an angry person, but now I'm not like that anymore. I've been set free from that. Lord, I want to be the kind of person that says, I know what it's like to harbor unforgiveness, but I've been set free from that. I want that to be my testimony, and I want that to be the testimony of every single person in here. We, we, have, we are overcomers if we have put our faith and trust in you. But we need to make sure that we understand that, that our, our overcoming of sin because of what you did on the cross is supposed to impact our ability to overcome in every area of our lives. That we don't have to walk around with shame and guilt and fear and anger and unforgiveness and addiction and all of these things. We don't have to walk in those things. You've given the, us the ability to, to walk in freedom, so help us to do that not only for our sake, but the sake of other people as well. So again, Lord, I thank you first and foremost just for the victory that you have given me in my life, that I am not the person that I used to be. I'm a new creation in you, and so is every single person in here that's put their faith and trust in you. Lord, I, that is part of my testimony, that I was blind, but now I see. I was a slave, and now I've been set free. I was dead, and now I am alive. I pray that we value and treasure those things, Lord, and allow them to permeate in every other area of our lives. So we love you and thank you for, for all of these things today, these truths. Go with us as we leave this place today. Help us to walk with our heads up, our heads held high, knowing that we are victors in you. So we love you and thank you for these things, Lord, and we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.